it's nice to see familiar faces, isn't it? Especially when it comes to a character that might be considered one of the kings of 90s anti-heroes, Venom. Now, yeah, I'm completely aware that Venom was actually created in the 80s, but he's always lumped in with 90s characters because that's the time where he gained a bulk of his popularity, especially with a certain young boy living in the Chicago suburbs around that time named Micah Curtis. You see, Venom isn't just my favorite anti-hero. He's not just my favorite comic book character. Eddie Brock is my favorite character in fiction. At one point... I owned every single miniseries that he appeared in, from the great ones like Lethal Protector to the bad ones like The Madness. Anyway, the less said about that, the better. But because Mark Miller is a pretentious douchebag at points, Eddie Brock was almost killed off, and Mac Gargan, of all people, was given the Venom symbiote in a poor attempt to make him feel like a legitimate threat again. Whilst Gargan went through his cannibalistic grimdark phase, and then Flash Thompson took up the mantle in a much better editorial move, Brock was sort of in flux. He had cancer, then he got better and became anti-Venom, and then he lost that power during Spider Island, and then later became Toxin, which kind of sucked because they killed off an interesting character in Pat Mulligan off-panel and never did anything interesting with Eddie as Toxin. Venom 150 takes the time to correct the damage, Considering he was most recently tied to the FBI, the second time that he had done this, by the way, and they got him away from that mess and returned him to his status quo. Eddie is Venom again for the first time in 13 years. And now I'm going to review the start of his new run with Venom 150. Now, here's the thing. There are three stories here total. Plus, I have to also fill you in on what happened prior to this. So I'm going to unpack all of that piece by piece. The first bit here is a prequel to the events of Venom 150 in the book itself. So, one of the stories that I actually have to do is catch you up on the story of Lee Price, and then the two Eddie Brock stories in 150. So, just to rehash, we're going to do this, I'm going to catch up with Lee Price, and then we'll go through what's in the contents of Venom 150 as well. Okay, let's go ahead and start with the prequel that's already in Venom 150. Have I confused you yet? I've confused me yet. Anyway, we pick up with Flash Thompson and his sidekick, Mania, back in New York and kicking ass. So after sending Mania home for the night after kicking around some demons, he's attacked by somebody in power armor, who puts up a fight and pisses him off, but then uses sonic waves to knock the Venom symbiote off of Flash. Oddly enough, the symbiote runs off, and as the asshole in the armor is taunting him, Flash punts him right in the face with one of his fake legs. Oddly enough, that seems to be the finishing blow. After that, Flash runs off to chase down the Venom symbiote, while this Agent Wamba confirms that the plan was to knock the symbiote off of Flash. Now, Flash, unfortunately for him, is unable to find Venom, which, of course, leads us to the story of one Lee Price. Lee's story starts in Venom Volume 3, Issue 1. Lee is an asshole criminal, looking to make some cash. He meets with a friend of his named Tony in a diner, alongside one Mac Gargan, with his jaw actually surgically put back on. For those of you who don't know, the superior Spider-Man actually punched it clean off. Because, well, Mac Gargan, without the Venom symbiote, kind of a joke. You see, Gargan, aside from still being a criminal, also works for Alchemax, which was formerly known as both Allen Chemical and Oscorp before the two merged. And Alchemax has been established as the exact same company from Spider-Man 2099 through Dan Slott's run on The Amazing Spider-Man and Superior Spider-Man. Now, during a job working with Gargan, Lee bonds with the stray Venom symbiote and subjugates it with his strong will. It was established in Guardians of the Galaxy that symbiotes are imprinted with their host's mental states, and there's a conflict between Lee and the Venom symbiote. Lee wants to be a gun for hire for the Black Cat, who currently is the kingpin of crime, so he can make money from criminal outfits. And Venom, well, doesn't want to be evil. The Venom symbiote has spent a good amount of time being a heroic being attached to a heroic person, and doesn't want to change that. As it goes on, Lee gets himself into more trouble, and it all culminates when the FBI brings in none other than Eddie Brock, 
to solve the problem of this new symbiote owner while Spider-Man is trying to take Lee down. The ending of this little story of Lee, or at least for now, ends with Spider-Man and Eddie Brock forming a plan together to get the symbiote away from Lee. In a really unique plan, Spider-Man coaxes it to leave Lee, given how the symbiote is obsessed with him and at this point even admires his heroism. The symbiote engages Lee in a mental struggle, which up to this point Lee had been dominating, and in a rather awesome moment, beats him, and beats him badly, afterwards heading towards Spider-Man. Side note, I love Peter's expression in this panel of, why do I do these things to myself? Anyway, the FBI traps the symbiote, and in a scene that has the emotional feel that is eerily similar to the ending of Amazing Spider-Man 363, the symbiote goes from admiring Parker to hating him because of this deception. Afterwards, Eddie Brock snaps the neck of the guy who's guarding the symbiote at the FBI and reunites with it once more. For those wondering, Venom Volume 3 1 through 6 does get a recommendation from me. Lee Price is a much better take on a purely evil Venom than either Mac Gargan or Angelo Fortunato, and hopefully we'll get to see him again in some capacity. Just not as Venom. Mike Costa and Gerardo Sandoval make a great team, by the way, so definitely pick up those books if you have the chance. But anyway, that catches us up to Venom number 150. This book starts off with a quote from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, and a declaration from Brock that this is a love story. What we're greeted with next is a lovely splash page that's a visual history of Eddie Brock up to this point. You see his marriage to the now-deceased Anne Weying, his career-breaking article on the Sin Eater, him losing his job because he interviewed the wrong one, and him becoming the Venom we all know and love. It's sort of a creepy monologue from Brock, but a well-written one. It's rather obvious that Eddie is convincing himself, in a way, that this is what he is destined to be, with ties into the idea of this being his nightmare of choice that was in the quote from Conrad on the first page. We can see that Eddie is still THICK, and the relationship between himself and the symbiote is oddly reminiscent of the Toxin symbiote and Patrick Mulligan. Just as a side note, I love that idea. Both with Venom slash Eddie and Toxin slash Patrick, there is always a we, not I, dynamic. We are Venom. We are Toxin. As opposed to Carnage, who sees himself and the symbiote as one singular being. With the symbiote having its own voice, in the manner that Peter Milligan had written Toxin in his miniseries, we can see a dynamic between the two minds, as opposed to just assuming what the symbiote is thinking. As Venom swings around New York, he comes across some armored mooks breaking into a building. As is customary with Venom, he does his creepy horror villain sort of thing by sneaking up behind them and scaring the bejesus out of them. Wisely, one of the mooks runs for his damn life. The other mooks try to fight, and there's a couple things that this page reestablishes for the reader. The first is Venom saying that the electrical weapons tickle. For those of you playing the home game, the Marvel 616 version of Venom, which is the mainstream Venom, the one that's in the main continuity, does not have a weakness to electricity like his ultimate counterpart. It actually has little to no effect on him. Just for reference, when Venom joined the Sinister Six years ago and summarily turned on them, he actually defeated Electro, the same Electro that almost killed Spider-Man more than once, within one page of the comic. So these guys? They're kind of fucked. Another element that it has is that Venom is not necessarily quick to pull the trigger on someone if they ask for mercy, and he doesn't have all the facts. He's not really a berserker. He's actually a thinking man's villain, which is one thing that I've always liked about him. Yeah, he's goofy, he's over the top sometimes, but he thinks. He's not, you know, really insane. He's crazy like a fox, if that makes any sense. So he puts the one mook down gently to listen to what he's actually saying about why they're robbing a biochemical firm. Now, when it seems like the mook has lied to Venom, he does not take it well meaning he tosses one of them at a wall with enough force to crush a man's skull, and then he crushes the other guy's hand. Oh, and for mook number three, he demands to know what they came for. Lo and behold, it's a cherry tomato. An apparently million dollar cherry tomato, but a cherry tomato nonetheless. Eddie, realizing that he's used an extremely excessive amount of force for the situation, leaves immediately as the police show up. This is something I'm very happy that Mike Costa got right in his writing, and Trad Moore got correct in the art. 
you see, Venom, especially when David Michelini was writing him and Mark Bagley was drawing him, was a very expressive character with a lot of complexity to him. Now, he wears his heart on his sleeve, so you can always tell what he's thinking. And you see instant anger and regret with himself. On the next page, we see a conversation between Eddie and the symbiote, with there being some major confusion. The symbiote is still suffering from the violent imprint that Lee Price left on it, coupled with the anger from Spider-Man, or at least a, a reader would assume. Whereas it seems that Eddie has actually a clear path of the kind of hero he wants to be. It seems like Eddie's philosophy at this point is he wants the punishment to fit the crime. If someone kills another person, then he'll kill them. However, if they're just thieves who weren't looking to harm another person physically, that they were just damaging property, then it seems like he'd rather much incapacitate them. It's not too far from how he was in Lethal Protector, where he kills a man in an alleyway once it seems like he's going to rape a woman that he was already in the process of robbing because he was dissatisfied with what was in the purse. Granted, Eddie's mind is a little bit less crazy, a little bit less quirky than it was before, though I want to see Venom pat someone's head again, damn it. Just as a side note, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that Eddie Brock as a character can actually be pretty damn funny. Check out Venom Lethal Protector if you never have before. It's a fantastic series. Anyway, we next see Eddie trying to get his head on straight, and lo and behold, he's in the same church that he was when he and the symbiote began this little relationship in the first place. He also scares off some violent gangsters who look like weebs. And Eddie, no, 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 hold on. Just in the future, you're supposed to purge the weebs not scare them off. Next, what you do is you go after the ones who dress like dragon maids for great justice, and you kill them. You kill them violently. Anyway, Eddie is approached by a pastor who is wondering what brought Brock there. Eddie shares right off the bat that the longtime Catholic in Brock has lost his religion, and confides in the pastor, though, that he's happy that he and the symbiote are reunited. But because of the way that he and the symbiote have changed, he's having a bit of an identity crisis. The pastor hits home when he suggests that this relationship could go bad for him if he's not careful. Of course, being completely oblivious to the fact that he's talking to, well, one of the most famous supervillains and anti-heroes that is out there. Now, I really enjoy this page, quite frankly, because it makes sense. Though Eddie is at a point where his faith is gone, he's going back to a place that's familiar to him. And it makes sense that he'd return to that church. And because he grew up Catholic, it makes sense that he would confide in a pastor, that he would feel comfortable opening up to somebody who is a man of God. It's a really neat scene that really shows you where Eddie's conflicts are, but also kind of how he's grown up a bit. That he understands that he has to take responsibility for what's going on. He has to work at this. He has to change because he truly believes that what he can do is something good with the symbiote. Now, whether or not you as the reader think that it's really and truly something good is up for interpretation, but I think, personally, that's what makes this character so interesting. The next page also reveals a bit more of Eddie's state of mind. First off, though, how awesome is that bomber jacket that Eddie had the symbiote morph into? <laughs> Seriously, I want one of my own. Anyway, we hear from both parties that they both want this union very badly, but Eddie is concerned about the symbiote and where its mind is at. Being that Eddie's a very stubborn person who often has shown tunnel vision in the past, you can tell that he wants to help the symbiote fix the issue. And the symbiote is obviously in a state of mental distress, and it wants to get better. Of course, this comic can't all be character development, though. Suddenly, Mac Gargan shows up. Yeah, the Scorpion himself. To reestablish what I had said earlier, aside from working with the Black Cat, who is now the new Kingpin in New York, Gargan still works for Alchemax, like I mentioned earlier. Since Gargan has unfinished business on more than one level with Venom, a fight breaks out. Also, I love this splash page that shows the start of the clash between the two and how Eddie morphs into Venom. I'm really hoping we see stuff like this in the eventual movie when that comes out. Now, though Brock seems to be doing well at the start, this scorpion suit is tailor-made to fight symbiotes. Gargan takes the upper hand once he starts using Sonics and gives Brock some nasty head trauma. But Venom is not a stupid fighter. Keep in mind that he's beaten the Human Torch by properly using his surroundings and the symbiote in a clever manner. That's a fight that normally he would have no business winning. Anyway, the symbiote and Eddie use some psychological warfare. Plus, pulls Gargan's fancy new suit apart from inside out. After a couple of punches, Gargan is down for the count. 
Now, the symbiote sees that Eddie is badly hurt from the head trauma and starts the healing process while taking Eddie away. The downside is that the symbiote, left to its own devices, did something that's horrendous. You see, while Eddie was unconscious, it decided to attack the pastor in the church. For those who don't know, this is uncharacteristic for Eddie Brock at this point. The pastor is what Eddie would consider to be an innocent. Were he conscious, he would have never harmed that poor man in his life. Yet here he is, holding the wounded body of a man of God, probably not sure about what to do next. The final part of the comic is written by none other than Venom's creator, David Michelini, and this is awesome. Plus, it's also penciled by the legendary Ron Lim, who some of you might remember from the incredible miniseries called Thanos Quest. This little story is, from my guess, from a time prior to Maximum Carnage and Lethal Protector, considering it takes place in Queens, and during Lethal Protector, Eddie had moved out to California. Eddie, being the goofball that he is, has snuck into a toy star and started pulling the heads off of Spider-Man action figures. Well, a, a lot of Spider-Man action figures. Jesus, Eddie. Anyway, he's been staking out the area because some scumbags have been robbing malls. Venom apparently interrogated some folks and ended up finding out their next stop. As one of the aforementioned scumbags threatens to kill a mall cop, things start to pick up. As is usual for Venom, he promptly begins kicking ass. He chucks the first guy out of a window and then gums up the barrel of another's gun, forcing it to explode and taking the asshole's hand with it. With douchebag number three, we see something that some people might not even know that Venom can even do. He can cloak. So he gets behind this guy, grabs him by the throat after uncloaking, and chokes him to death. With the day saved, Venom goes to check up on the security guard, who then shoots Venom. Granted, Venom is bulletproof, so that of course does nothing but confuse the big jet black bruiser. It's here that the guard makes a huge mistake. He uses a woman, an innocent woman, as a shield. Bad move. Eddie, now incredibly pissed off, suffocates this dopey moron for trying to put a woman's life in mortal danger. In a scene that David Michelini mastered in penning years ago with this character, the woman says that Venom's a monster. But Venom makes a statement that is sort of a double entendre. Now, she knows by saying monster that she's talking about him. But he says something that could make her think. He says, correct, ma'am, but he won't harm you now. I dig scenes like this because they make you think as the reader. What Eddie did wasn't outside the realm of what an anti-hero would do. Yet, a normal person seeing this giant beast with a face full of fangs doing this would reasonably be scared of him. But was the security guard just a scared schmuck? Or was him using a human shield showing a level of evil that is ridiculously detestable? That shows that he's just as bad as the criminals? I'll let the audience be the judge on this one. The comic ends with Eddie saying that the betrayals that he suffered are a net positive, because it brought him and the symbiote together, creating Venom. It gives him the mental strength and fortitude to dole out justice, quote-unquote, as I guess only Venom can, in a quirky yet ridiculously violent method with a morality that's more orange and blue than black and white. Anyway, let's go ahead and bring this to a close. Venom issue 150 gets an 8 out of 10 from me. It's definitely a must-read. The art is great, the story's really solid, and it sets the stage for what will come next for Eddie in the long run. Both adult Micah and kid Micah are happy, and I don't know why I just referred to myself in the third person. Maybe Venom is rubbing off on me a little bit. But it's great to see Eddie back not only as Venom, but as the lethal protector. You see, this Venom is the best Venom, meaning that he's an anti-hero, and keeps a lot of his goofy quirks but now has a level of experience and maturity that adds a new wrinkle to the character. Now, I'm going to keep reading this book, but I'm going to say so far I'm loving what I'm seeing. So before I go, knowing what the score is on this book, let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to continue reviewing this new Venom run as the issues come out. But with all that said, folks, my name is Micah Curtis, and I'll see you next time. Deus Volt!